Okay, well, thank you all for your introductions and hello to everybody who's joined us today. We're very excited to have you here um, to this next session of Empower, uh, which is all about helping you to grow your digital and computational skills. Uh, please be aware that at Escalator, we have a code of conduct. So we are dedicated to creating a safe, respectful and collegial environment for the benefit of everyone who participate in our program. So essentially, um, please just treat people with respect and dignity. Just to kick off, just a recap quickly on Escalator and this Empower Track. Uh, SADILAR, which is the South African Center for Digital Language Resources, established Escalator to bring about the adoption of digital research methodologies and practices to the social sciences and humanities in South Africa. And Escalator consists of a digital champions program, which is a mentorship program in combination with capacity development and awareness raising. And Empower is one of the tracks of Escalator and Empower is um, for women in social sciences and humanities affiliated to a South African institution um, who are interested in learning more about digital and computational tools and skills to help them in their research. Um, and in Empower, we have two sessions per month. One is a presentation such as this one with the opportunity for questions and discussion, uh, followed two weeks later by a co-working session. And these co-working sessions are for people to either work in a quiet space within the online meeting room um, in a separate room known as a breakout room, um, or you also have the opportunity in the general room to ask questions in a safe space with friendly and helpful people. Uh, so every week as well, we've now introduced an onboarding session um, for people that want to come along and, and ask questions, but we'll discuss that more at the end of the presentation. Um, so these spaces are really just you know, places where you can come to ask questions. It's a safe place with friendly and helpful people for us to just have a chat and you can bring your questions and, and it's just a place to learn. Um, and so far we've had two sessions. Our first session was a fantastic presentation by Bianca Kramer and Jeroen Bosman on the research workflows on which we are basing this Empower track. Um, and we followed this with a co-working session two weeks later, uh, where we introduced participants to the templates that we've created to help you in your journey of adopting new technologies and learning new skills. And we've got the, the links to these um, in the shared document as well, if you want to have a look. So this is the research workflow described by Bianca and Jeroen. And today we're going to start off our journey around this workflow by discussing the tools for preparation and discovery. Um, but before we get going on a discussion about this, um, we just wanted to chat a bit more about the concept of a research workflow or life cycle. And some of you may or may not have heard of a research workflow, what is also, what is also known as a research life cycle or a data life cycle. And many of you, in fact, may already be doing various steps of the cycle anyway, without being aware that there is this term for the process of research that you're doing. So if you do a web search for research life cycle or data life cycle, you see there are several versions of it, um, but mostly with the same basic steps. So the research life cycle is the process that a researcher undertakes for a study or a project from the inception uh, or the start of the project to the completion of the project. And research data management is and, and should be involved in each step of this process. Um, and we are gonna talk about this today. Um, the cycle consists of various stages and you may or may not be involved in all stages of the research life cycle. And if you are, you may not spend equal amounts of time in all of these stages. Um, so there's not an expectation that you should know about all of the tools across the whole cycle. Uh, what we're going to do in Empower is to induce, introduce you to some of the tools for all of the phases, um, but don't worry, this is just to expose you to them and there, there's no expectation that you need to know or learn about all of them. <clears throat> so for Empower, we are basing our discussions on Bianca and Jeroen's research workflow that they introduced during their presentation in May, um, as this is particularly designed to talk about the tools that can be used at each step of the cycle. Um, and in Empower, we want to help you learn about tools that can be used for each step of this workflow as you sort of go through your project or your study. Um, so we're just gonna stop here for five minutes or so, just to give you some time to read through the slide. And then we're gonna put a Zoom poll up. Um, and if you can just indicate, if you are currently working on a project, which phase of the project you are currently in. Or you might be in, in different phases or for the same project, you might be at the same time doing analysis and writing up, or you may, may have submitted an, uh, an article. Um, so you may be involved in more than one phase on the same project or in 
uh, different phases for different projects. So what are you spending your time on at the moment? Great, thank you so much to everyone for filling that in. Um, okay, that's really interesting. Um, so I think today we can have a great discussion. Everyone can share, teach everyone else what they're doing in their various phases. Um, so to move on just a little bit about considerations for using tools and for example, what should you think about when choosing a tool? Why would you use a certain tool? For example, how well is the tool known? Um, and you may need to consider field specific tools. So what tools are used by your discipline or by collaborators or supervisors? This may determine the tools that you're going to have to use. Um, and also how available is the tool? So is it free and open source or do you have to buy it or pay for a license? And what is interoperability like? So how well does the tool work with other tools that you may want to use in your workflow? Um, so for example, R and Python are becoming more interoperable and each has packages that enable you to work in the one language within the other. Um, another example could be, say you want to write up your research um, using Google Docs and you want a reference manager. We're gonna discuss reference managers in a bit. Um, so for example, Zotero. So consider how well these tools work together. So how interoperable are they? Do they even work together? Um, are there any bugs or issues that will prevent me from using both of these tools or should I look for another tool that will work better for my needs? Um, so interoperability is really useful. And if you do use tools that are interoperable, it'll change your research life for the better. Um, it will increase your efficiency and accuracy and makes collaborations more fluent and much easier. And there are many benefits for using open tools. Um, also, this is for making data open. Um, and this is based on Bianca and Jeroen's slides. Again, we just wanted to reiterate them here. Um, and using an open tool, for example, enables collaboration and reuse, um, including reproducibility. So for example, you can send files, for example, to collaborators um, and they'll be able to open them and therefore reuse of these files or of data um, and reproducibility down the line is enhanced as these files will always be able to be opened if they are in a non-proprietary format um, or using non-proprietary software. And the better benefit of this for you, as I've said, is it's better for collaboration, um, but also for people being able to reuse and reproduce your research you can get more collaborators and potentially more authorship on papers or citation opportunities um, because of people that want to use your data. Um, using open tools also supports researchers moving in between institutions. So if you have something in your research workflow for which you use a proprietary tool at one institution, but then you move to another institution that potentially doesn't have that tool or pay for that tool, then, then you might be sitting with a bit of a problem. Um, and this also applies to collaborating with people from different institutions where some institutions use this set of tools and another institution uses a different set of tools. Um, so yeah, preventing vendor lock-in. So for example, if your data is on a particular platform that is potentially like a, pay a paid for platform, your institution is then almost obliged to keep on paying for that platform. Um, also consider if there's an exit plan, if the tool's not available anymore, this is a risk. So then what would happen to your data, for example, if you no longer, if the tool doesn't exist. Um, open tools also support community-based development and innovation and contribute to common infrastructure. However, we are aware that reality may be very different. There are many other considerations to take into account. So for example, efficiency, um, tools that are currently open may not give you the functionality that you need to do your research. Uh, so you'll need to make decisions based on your goals um, and what you need. Also, your institution may not provide support for a certain tool or your department or faculty may not have experience with a particular tool. As I mentioned, you might need to use the tools that your supervisor or your collaborators use just you know, to enable um, collaboration to be possible. Um, and in these empower presentations and discussions, we're going to give you some examples just to kind of get you going and to expose you to a few things. But you really do need to consider your various requirements and your situation, what tools would suit you best. And then go out and look at all the tools available and make decisions based on your needs um, and the considerations we've described. But it is useful as well to know what is out there and what's available. Uh, for example, this is a tools database that's been put together by Bianca and Jeroen that they introduced in May's presentation. 
Um, and it lists many tools for each steps of the research workflow, what the tools do, where you can find them. They also gave options for other tools, databases, such as these shown here. I'm not gonna go into any detail. You can click on the links later and have a look. Now we head into the first phase of the research workflow, and that is preparation. And for preparation, we're going to firstly, you know, briefly look at where you can find help, and then defining your research priorities, managing your project, managing your data, and where to find funding. And these are all things that you need to think about when preparing your project. So where to find help? There are places where you can go to find help with each of the steps of your research workflow. For example, if you go online, there are many guides and, and information you can find there. It's also really important to speak to people. So speak to your supervisors, speak to your mentors, or speak to your peers if you've got them, whether you're a researcher or a student. Just chat to people, find, just you know, gather information in this phase while you prepare, um, and just to kind of get an idea of how things are done. Um, there are also institutions and universities that have research support offices, and we've listed some of these here. So if we move on to defining and setting research priorities, and many of the tools for this step overlap with the discovery phase, and Anelda is going to be discussing that shortly, um, such as tools for searching for literature or data or tools for writing. Um, and in order to define and set your research priorities, you do need to do some research, so you do need these tools, um, but they're going to be discussed in the discovery phase. And in setting your research priorities, again, as I've said, it also helps to speak to people, <clears throat> speak to collaborators if you have them, speak to your peers, mentors, supervisors, and also use this time to find collaborators for your work. And if we move on to managing your project, it's a really good idea in your preparation phase to think about project management um, and to plan for your project and to use project management tools in an ongoing way throughout your research project. And in this way, you can organize your project, you can organize your research team if you have one, collaborations if you have them. And for this, you can look for help again um, at your institution or your university research support office, um, or what tools they may support. You can also download free versions of various tools. So for example, I've given three here, Trello, Jira, and Asana. And these all have free paid plans. Uh, so free plans as well as paid plans. Uh, so for example, if we quickly look at, at Trello, and they give various templates that you can use. So if I just click on, for example, the simple project board, um, it consists of you can change the background um, of the picture at the back, which is known as the board. And then you've got all of these lists and you can customize this however you want. This is just one of the suggestions for the template. So they've got a list for brainstorming ideas, a to-do list, a doing list and a done list. Um, and within these lists, you can add a whole lot of tasks that you need to do and you can add de deadlines and dates and lists of subtasks. So it's really a way of you know, yeah, customize it however you want. It's a way of organizing your project and kind of managing the whole thing and, and seeing the tasks that you have to do. Um, you can also use timelines to manage your project. So for example, Gantt charts. So this is just a, an image search um, for Gantt, Gantt charts. Uh, it's basically just a timeline to manage your project. Uh, so a schedule of what you need to do by when. Um, I actually use these quite often if I have a specific project to manage. So for example, so for example, this is a Gantt chart um, I put together. You, you can go to the internet and download various templates, um, but I just put one together in Google Sheets. So you know, the red is the deadline for when the project was due um, and the timeline is across the top. So these are all of the weeks that I have left to do the project in. And then each element of the project I list here on the left under a heading. And then each, all of the tasks associated with that element are kind of listed under it. And we had a team organizing this event so um, I can manage, sort of keep track of who's doing what I'm using this as well. And then I color code everything. So the blue, when I schedule and set what I'm going to do by when I highlight that in blue. And then once something is done, we pass a date, then I'll sort of change that to gray. Um, and obviously you can use whatever colors you want. These are just the ones that work for me. You can, you know, for example, I've got a little one for outstanding. So if, say, for example, this task, I, I should have done it by this day, but then we passed that day, um, then I can come and 
highlight that orange so it stands out to me. I know that, okay, this task is outstanding. I still have to go back and do that. Um, so this is just an example, as I say, using a Google Sheet. You can find a lot of templates online for that as well. Um, so yeah, there are various ways of managing your project and it's a really good idea to do this. It does take a bit of time to put it together, but it really is worth it. Um, I know for myself, if I've got a project to manage with a lot of tasks, I could sometimes find myself spinning a bit unless I manage to sort of, if, unless I manage it and visualize everything that I have to do and sort of give everything a timeline so I can know that I can get everything done. So it's just a way of helping you feel more in control of your work and on top of all of the tasks that you have to do. And you can see what needs to happen when, and you can plan for it and make sure that you have enough time to do everything. And it makes achieving tasks by due dates feel a lot more achievable because you've planned for it. Um, so I can highly recommend <clears throat> managing your project. And the next thing we're going to talk about is research data management. As we said, this should happen ideally at each phase of the research workflow. Um, it's basically about organizing data, as I've said, at all stages of the life cycle, from acquiring your data in the beginning to dissemination or publishing or sharing. Um, and it covers the initial planning and all of the day-to-day -day processes and also the long-term archiving and sharing of your data. Um, so it's a really good idea to think about how you're going to manage your data for each step of your research workflow. Um, so by managing your data, you can facilitate the use of your data now, but also by other researchers in future. And we've already touched on the use um, of data and reproducibility. Um, another important note is that increasingly funding bodies require the submission of a data management plan to ensure that your data can be preserved and shared. So really part of your preparation phase should include planning for research data management. So why should you manage your research data? What are the benefits? Um, there are many potential benefits of good research data management for you, um, for other researchers, as well as the wider community. For example, it's easier to control your data. You'll reduce the risk of data loss. Um, your data will be more visible, which could lead to increased citations and collaborations, which we've touched on already. Um, it also helps with the integrity of your research, so it will help to build trust in your work and validates your results. Also, as we've said, compliance with funder and institutional policies and expectations. Um, your research may have a greater impact, and it also enhances the reuse of your data, which we've spoken about already. Uh, so where can you find help with research data management? Again, your institution or university may have a research support office. Um, the libraries can often help, and there are also many resources online. So the FAIR data principles contain guidelines for good data management practice, um, and they aim at making data FAIR, which is findable, accessible, interoperable, and reusable. And essentially, it's a set of principles that makes your research more efficient, more transparent, more sustainable. And data here means all kinds of digi digital objects. So this includes amongst others, um, traditional research data, code, software, presentations, videos, sound recordings, photographs, um, and so forth. Um, and the FAIR principles apply to both data and metadata. So metadata being data about data, it's what you use to describe your data. And it's important when, for example, you want to deposit this into a repository or an archive, but generally it's good practice to put metadata together whenever collecting data so that you know in future, you know, what you've done with that data, how you collected it. So just briefly, what is FAIR? Um, the findable means that data can be discovered by both humans and machines. So for example, by using metadata, as we've said, uh, by referencing data with unique persistent identifiers, such as DOIs. Um, the accessible means that the data are archived in long-term storage and available um, using standard technical procedures. That doesn't mean the data has to be open, but it at least has to have information on how people can retrieve that data or not, depending if it's open or not. Uh, the interoperable, we've touched on this already, means that the data can be exchanged and used across different applications and systems. So in the future um, that it's accessible, for example, by using, using open file formats, uh, appropriate metadata, um, et cetera. And reusable, which we've also touched on, this means that the data are well-documented and curated, and there's rich information about 
how that data was created. Um, and this allows for the original results to be validated. Um, and this ensures data reproducibility, which also if someone wants to design a new project based on the original results. Um, so in other words, data reuse, um, which as we've said, this can encourage collaborations and avoids duplication of effort. And that's also a very important point because amongst other reasons why this is important these days, particularly with the amount of funding for research getting smaller and smaller, um, avoiding this duplication of effort is pretty important. So there are many resources available to learn more about FAIR data and how to apply the principles. For example, online, you can find many resources and references and papers. Again, your re university research office has, has information if, if you've got that office. Um, even if your university doesn't have a research office, look at the websites of other institutions for information. I've just given two of them here. Um, there's a lot of information there for you to go and look at. Um, this website here, How to FAIR, is, is a really useful one. It gives a lot of information about FAIR data and how you can apply the principles to your data. And there's also videos explaining all sorts of topics, including research data management, and it's all very accessible and, and very, very good, good information. Um, alternative data management learning resources, for example, the UK Data Service Learning Hub, open educational resource. Um, so you can go through and click on all of these and, and have a look. There's, there's a lot of information out there. Um, so a crucial part of research data management is putting together a data management plan or DMP. And this is essentially a document that describes how you're gonna treat your data during a project and what happens to the data after the project ends. So for example, how are you collecting the data? What is the type of data? Are there any ethical or privacy concerns? What is the license? Is the data in a proprietary format? Um, will the data be fair? Where is it going to be saved somewhere? You know, that sort of thing. And why should you put together a DMP? As we've said, it's often a requirement these days of many funding agencies and institutions. It's a way to articulate and plan for your research data needs and will help you address issues and focus on areas that need further thought. So it's a great planning tool. It's kind of, we've spoken about project management, it's kind of the management, but for data. Um, so it's a very good idea. And how do you put one together? Um, you can find templates from funders, for example, if it's a requirement of theirs for you to compile a DMP, they may have a template they want you to use. Institutions also sometimes have templates such as DERISA, which is the Data Intensive Research Initiative of South Africa, and uh, universities sometimes have templates. There are also many templates online and many free online tools for putting together a DMP. In fact, many of the institution research support offices, if the institute doesn't have their own template, they often point you to these online tools anyway. Um, so you can take a look at these uh, to see how to put one together. Um, and quickly show you, so this is on this <clears throat> DMP online tool, for example. So here is just, I've just put together kind of a test plan. There's no information in it yet. Um, yeah, so you just put information about the title, the abstract dates, funding status, that type of thing. You can add information about contributors to your project and then the plan overview, it'll give you all sorts of sort of hints and tips of the types of information that you need or should put into the plan. So how you've collected your data, metadata. Um, I don't know how well you can see this. Let me increase the screen a bit. Um, yeah, ethical considerations, where you're gonna store or back up your data, um, responsibilities, data sharing, and then you can go into the right plan tool. And in, yeah, this is where you would add all the information. And you can also share your plan with, with collaborators if you have them. Um, and then you can download it, which is very useful. Download it for yourself in all these different formats or download it and send it to a funder or the institution if they want one. So yeah, so this is a really just an example of one of, one of the tools. Um, be aware as well that doing good data management from the start of your project can be very beneficial in more than one way. So for example, getting your data published in a data journal, and we give an example here, the Journal of Open Humanities Data. So we encourage you to go there and have a look. 
And then lastly, in the preparation phase can also include uh, looking for funding or contracts. And it's often difficult to know most times, actually difficult to know where to find funding and, and to actually get funding. Um, so these are a few places that you can look. There's the National Institute for Humanities and Social Sciences, the South African National Research Foundation, the Common Language Resources and Technology Infrastructure, Scholarship of Teaching and Learning Program. You can have a look at university websites, um, but if anyone know, else knows of any other places to look for funding, again, please add this to the shared document just so we can you know, share the knowledge that we have. And at this point, we just want to pause a bit and ask people if, if anyone's got any questions. And then we are going to have a quick break after this before the discovery phase. Um, but yeah, does anybody have any questions up to now? I just want to make a comment. I also put the link in the shared document on the notes. Um, but for those working in humanities, and for those who want to disseminate your data using the Sadilar repository, they also have an amazing data management plan that you have to complete anyways if you want to put your data on their repository. Um, so starting there when you start planning your project um, is maybe a good idea. So I'm going to continue uh, with the next, with the, thanks, Ad, with the next part of the, um, talk and we're going to look at tools that you can use for discovering research but not only research for discovering a variety of things that you can use in your preparation and in your um, other phases as well so in this we're going to look at um, iterations of searching and reading and as marissa was pointing out earlier um, and tony was also saying that you, you often get stuck in a, in a loop where you have to go from analysis back to researching, um, back to your analysis, back to researching, or you might be looking for new materials, or you might get um, even to the, the part where you already pub, uh, written your uh, article, and then um, you get feedback from the reviewers, and you have to go back to your reading, searching and reading to find more information to clarify certain points. We're also going to be looking at tools for writing, um, we're going to look at tools for accessing articles um, and research and other things, um, getting alerts and recommendations, and for reading, viewing, and annotating um, research material. Just looking again at the presentation from uh, Linda, Bianca, and um, Jeroen, here is a workflow, um, a few examples of workflows that you may have used, some of these tools you may have combined with others. Um, and at the moment, we're looking at the discovery phase. And here you can see a few tools, some of which may be familiar to you. Web of Science, you may have access to through your university, for example. You may have used Google Scholar to look for, for research. Then um, there's Mendeley and Sparrow, and, and some of these tools might not be familiar to you. I wanted to go to a very specific workflow, which I recently found on Twitter. Um, Maya Gostilla um, is a PhD student um, in neurodegenerative diseases. And she recently shared on Twitter a workflow that works for her to read papers as part of her PhD. And she, she describes her workflow very, very nicely um, in the Twitter feed, which I thought was just so kind and helpful. And you can go and look at it. And some of these tools might be new to you. Some of these tools might be familiar with you. But she talks about um, how she finds papers, how she reads it, and how she annotates these papers. So how she makes notes on um, what is interesting, what you can use in her in a research, maybe share information with colleagues, um, and how she also gets, how she finds papers. Um, so that, that's quite a useful link, and I've shared it in the uh, presentation as well at the bottom of that slide. Her workflow is there. So you may have exposure to certain tools through the research group that you're working in, your faculty or department, maybe tools or um, workflows that you've been introduced to by the libraries. But um, it's often interesting to take a look at what other people are doing especially as Anne was saying, there might be ways to make your workflow, streamline your workflow, save a lot of time 
work more reproducibly, not always have 20, 30 tabs open, trying to read different papers, um, and then your computer crashes and you lose those papers. Um, so there's, there's really a wide range of tools and workflows that you can use that you can combine together to make that process of finding, reading, um, and annotating your research easier. As Anne was saying, there's a lot of different ways to find information for in the, in the discovery phase. You, again, can speak to people. Um, attending events like this, you can learn about um, resources. Um, you can look at journals online and um, very big emphasis, of course, on open access journals. I know um, oftentimes there are research that you don't have access to via your university subscription. Take a look at alternative ways to get access to those publications that you're interested in. Write to the authors, um, ask them if you could have a copy of it. You can also um, look on um, ResearchGate um, and there are other platforms where you can also get access to research that may be behind paywalls um, that you have a hard time getting hold of. Um, there's a variety of search engines, for example, Google Scholar. Um, you can also look at tools that harvest content or index journals, like, for example, Ampe Wall and the um, Director of Open Access Journals. Those are um, all articles that you will have full text access to. And then abstract or citation databases like Scopus or Web of Science. Again, these are typically the things that you uh, learn about in your university or through your libraries as well. And then ResearchGate. Um, tools for searching. So um, we don't, we're not only focusing on articles, but you can also look for data. Again, with a big drive for open science, people are more um, inclined to start sharing data. And if they're not allowed to share the data, to share the metadata that describes what data is available. And you can always reach out to people to um, try and collaborate um, and get access to their data, or um, the data might be available openly. So you can look at data repositories, um, some journals, as Anne was just showing, the journal for open um, humanities data, also publish information about data and links to data. Um, and then there is code. So you can also reuse other people's code software. Um, there are journals that publish um, code um, and software. You can also find code and software on GitHub or Bitbucket. Those are repositories sp specifically used by software developers and research software developers to um, host their code and make it accessible. Um, remember when you are looking at code and data and everything else, just have a look at the licensing under which it is published. Um, you can also find proposals online. And I know from own experience that we have published funded and unfunded proposals um, open, under open licenses because we would like people to build on our ideas. Um, there's, there's quite a lot of uh, people these days publishing their, their, their proposals. So if you have an idea for a funding proposal, take a look. Maybe there's a good outline, a structure of a proposal. Maybe there's some content that you can reuse or um, and modify to you know, work for you as well. Um, see what other people have done. You don't have to redevelop, uh, reinvent the wheel. So for these two examples, I'm specifically showing Figshare and Zenodo. Those two are both um, open access repositories where you can find data, code, um, images, um, articles, presentations, and all kinds of other resources. Um, so you can also, again, go and look at the 101 Innovations WordPress um, site where they have data available for all the different tools across all the different life cycles, uh, all the different phases of the life cycle. Another tool that uh, people are normally not familiar with is Open Knowledge Maps. Um, I'm going to open that here. So Open Knowledge Maps give you access to, to re research. And maybe let's say um, Open Science and Africa. 
And if it doesn't take too long, I can show you what happens here. So this software goes and look online for any papers that have um, a link to open science and Africa. And then it will give you a kind of a graph of how sometimes it takes a, a few moments. It's just, okay. So here you can see there are kind of articles that are somewhat related. Um, here is multidisciplinary South Africa, Adonsonia, I don't know what that is. But you can see here that there's quite a number of papers listed here in this group. Um, data sharing, public engagement and open science. There's a few papers listed in that group. Legislation, scoping. And here, the, the website also gives you direct access to the publications and it shows you that these are open access papers. So you can directly get the PDFs, um, you can export it, or you can go, if I click on that, um, if I click on that, it will take me to the article itself. Now, I can also show you here, once I've clicked on that article, it gives me access to the paper. And to, by chance, this is a paper that I was recently reading. And now I can also use the Zotero plugin, and I'll mention Zotero uh, just now, but Zotero is a reference manager. I have installed a Zotero plugin on my Google Chrome, and I can click on this, and it saves it direct, directly into my Zotero library. You can see what Anne was also talking about earlier in terms of integrating tools. By, I could go from searching for literature to adding it to my reference manager, to opening the literature, to adding it to my reference manager in two clicks. Um, and that really, really makes things much easier. The, the open knowledge maps is limited. So it, it's not the be all and end all. You're not never going to use any other tool again, but um, it's quite a lot of fun and helps you to discover articles that you might not find through some of the other tools. Okay, tools for writing. Anne has been mentioning Google Docs. Um, we, we often use Google Docs to collaborate. I know at the university, some universities have been implementing uh, Microsoft products and there is um, SharePoint, which also allows you some of the functionality that Google Docs offer you. Um, if you're looking for free um, and open source software, you can use LibreOffice or OpenOffice. Um, those software comes at no cost. You don't have to pay a license fee. You can install it on any operating system. So you can use it on Linux or Mac or um, Windows. And you can also give it to students and collaborators so that they're not dependent on being at your institution and having access to an institutional license um, if that's what you need. Another tool that I would like to show you, I, um, I know this is often quite an intimidating um, I, oops, idea, is LaTeX um, used within Overleaf. So Overleaf is a tool that is available for free. This is my Overleaf account. Um, there, there are also paid versions, but this is the free version. Um, sidebar here is your normal folder directory. So these are files within a folder, just like you, what you would have on your computer. You can see some of the familiar um, buttons at the top there. Um, these files are stored in the cloud on the Overleaf um, server. So it's not, loc no, not locally available. What you see in this pane here is code um, written in LaTeX. I think this might be too small for you though. Let's see. Written in, written in LaTeX, and this might look very intimidating to start off with, but once you get the general gist of how to, to write things, you can generate something like this from the code. Uh, I can show you just what this, what this PDF looks like. So I've used that code to create a poster. We all know how difficult it could be to position all, all the elements exactly right so that it looks pretty and, and it uh, looks professional. Um, but using something like Overleaf and LaTeX allows you to get this beautiful layout with much less frustration than um, using some of the other tools. 
And you can also reuse your code if you want to create another poster that looks almost similar to this. You can go and just edit the content of your code. You don't have to redo this from scratch. You can also share this with collaborators. So there's a, a option there to share the project with your collaborators um, so that they can, you know, if you're doing a poster that is, um, for example, this one uh, was developed by a few people, everyone can, can add their names there um, and add their part as they wish. Um, and you can download this. So it's really, really powerful tool um, and really worth looking into if you are maybe maybe start with a Google Docs and then you can learn Overleaf um, if you if you want to try this out. Another nice thing about Overleaf is that it allows you it, it gives you access to um, let me show you Leaf journal templates. Um, gives you access to templates. Um, show all templates. So they are, for example, um, templates from the different journals, um, the eLife and a variety of tools. So you can, you can look at that. So you can use this template to generate the exactly right journal um, article for the journal where you want to submit um, and lose uh, and get out of some of the pain um, that we all have experienced before. Um, I'm going to skip the access alerts and recommendation slide. There is a, a academic guide showing how you can get access through, for example, um, RSS feeds, which may be unfamiliar, but you can read more about that on the slide. Um, I'm also going to skip hypothesis. We, maybe we can cover it in the co-working session. I wanted to just remind you about um, our templates. So, of course, what we're doing here is we're giving you a big overview of all kinds of tools and workflows and just stim stimulating some thoughts. But what we ultimately want is for you to look at your research workflow, identify one place that you want to enhance your workflow, and you're welcome to use our learning support templates, which I also share the link of in the slides, um, to identify uh, places where you think maybe your workflow is less um, um, productive, or if you know, you know, you've been wanting to improve maybe your data analysis, or you want to improve the way maybe something that we showed you today is something that you would like to try out. You can use these templates. Um, to help guide you through why you want to learn this, how you're going to learn it, and you can use, you can come to our co-working sessions and our uh, weekly onboarding and recap sessions to get some support and help in learning these new, um, these tools. Um, so, of course, as Anne was saying, we now have these weekly onboarding and refresher um, sessions. You're welcome to join anytime. This is really to help people who are missing sessions. Um, to get another opportunity to just feel that they sometimes people feel that they uh, can't join now because they missed one or two sessions already so it's too late for them to join but this program continuous uh, runs continuously so you can join at any time and you can join our um, weekly onboarding and refresher sessions if you just want to come and say hello um, if you have a quick question about anything that we've covered or anything that we haven't covered or if you just want to be part of the community come and join us um, so optional, you can join for as long as you want. If you just want to pop in for five minutes, you can come in for five minutes. If you want to stay for the hour, you're more than welcome. Then we've got the monthly research tool presentations, which will look like um, this session. Um, and each one will be run by one of our Empower uh, working team, uh, working group um, team members. And next month, we will be looking at analysis, if I remember correctly. Um, and then we also have the monthly co-working and collaboration sessions where you can get uh, you, you can get a quiet room um, as a breakout room where you can sort of work on anything that is related to this. Um, just come and say hi if you want to get some support, if you just want to feel connected to the community, you can come. If you have questions, if you have ideas, we'd love to see you there. And we'll also do um, what we promised, the Trello onboarding um, in our next session later this month. 
there's some more information about each of these different sessions for your um, interest, just each of the sessions described. Um, and then please join us on the Slack. We really invite you to not wait for these sessions to ask questions or to share information. You're welcome to join us on the Slack um, and have a continuous and asynchronous connection with the community. So there is the information about how to join as well. We'd love to hear from you. And there is all our contact information. So thank you very, very much for your time.